Welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to present to you the contributions from some of the students of John Merveke's course Beyond Nihilism. Those uh, who have agreed to have them published, you can listen to here. And I just wanted to uh, thank John again for teaching the course at my Halcyon Academy and also wanted to thank all of you again who have enrolled in the course. And if any one of you who wants to maybe go through the course material on your own now, which is basically a sequel to The Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, then you just follow the link in the description of this video and and Thank you very much, Johannes, for this opportunity to present a psychiatric psychotherapy case study, which I'm going to call The Relational Overcoming of Psychiatric Nihilism. Uh, my patient, uh, who I will call David, gave me explicit permission to present this and to have it posted on YouTube. So John Verbeke, who taught this excellent course on Beyond Nihilism, is centrally concerned with what he calls the meaning crisis. From my perspective as a psychiatrist working in Canada, I see this crisis undermining the function of the medical system and in psychiatry more specifically. And I think these institutions, in fact, reflect back and feed back into the wider cultural level meaning crisis. To put my finger on it, or at least a small fragment of it, we might say that the mainstream psychiatric paradigm falls prey to the modern scientific flavor of nihilism that Thomas Fuchs, German psychiatrist and philosopher, calls cerebrocentric neuroreductivism. But for the pur purposes of my presentation today, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll define psychiatric nihilism uh, as follows: the apparent undermining of unity by psychiatric by pardon me by psychic fragmentation or the undermining of interpersonal interdependence by egoic independence. Sorry if that's a mouthful. So the psychiatric overcoming of nihilism then, I propose, is the realization of a deep psychic unity in spite of fragmentation, and the realization of deep interdependence in spite of apparent independence. The following case study, I'll put forward uh, two seemingly independent instances of the realization of intrapsychic unity. So one occurred in me, the therapist, and one in David. But I want to make salient here the deep interdependence of these two apparently separate processes, the interdependent upon each other. And I want to identify this deeper resonant unity as the relational overcoming of psychiat uh, psychiatric nihilism. This is relevant to the cultural level meaning crisis because, as, as I'll present, a deep wellspring of courage was revealed to be accessible to me through this existential encounter with my patient. And the challenges that plague our Western culture and psychiatric paradigm require, I think, a significant amount of courage in order to be overcome. So here's the case study. David is a white male, slightly younger than myself, married, and has a child. When we first met, David was radically, he was a radically disconnected individual. He was disconnected from his own self, that is to say, to say dissociated. He was disconnected from the social world, uh, feeling exiled and unable to relate, and ultimately disconnected from reality, or at least he felt out of touch with reality. Uh, to summarize his pathological initial psychic state, I would say that he was a person who experienced love as annihilation. And he reacted to this by retreating deeply defensively into his interior. He got to this psychological uh, path pathological state in large part uh, due to having a close encounter with his uh, uh, nearly being murdered by his childhood best friend, who I will call Richard, who was a psychopath. So this was quite a traumatic uh, childhood. In, um, yeah, in consultation with colleagues, I diagnosed David with schizoid personality disorder. After eight years of weekly psychotherapy, a massive conflict arose in our previously excellent uh, therapeutic relationship. He revealed to me that what seemed to me like a risk that he might, in a dissociative state, bring some sort of harm to his daughter. In the case presentations that I uh, gave to other colleagues, some anxiety was expressed about whether I myself am safe to be in therapy with this man. A friend and colleague advised me to call Child and Family Services, a social agency, uh, to protect the child. After all, I was reminded there's a duty to report harm to children whenever we happen upon it in our day-to-day -day work as physicians. But my intuition uh, was that he was more, much more virtuous 
than what the expressed concerns were uh, from my risk averse peer group. Uh, in my hesitation about how to manage this, I informed David that I intended to make the phone call. And in that moment, he saw me as Richard, at his psychopathic best friend who he had not seen since age 13. And this is a process that Sigmund Freud might have described as a traumatic transference. What followed was an unorthodox was was unorthodox in psychiatric psychotherapy circles. I did not insist upon calling uh, child and family services right then and there, and I avoided foisting a Freudian interpretation over him. Um, intuitively, I prioritized ongoing attunement and connection. Helpful for me at this time was the prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. The salient line here being, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. In this way, I managed to keep him coming to weekly sessions with me, which I think was a much better outcome uh, than the possibility that he cut off the relationship with me completely. I figured this was actually in, his, in the best interest of his daughter. I decided to put off calling CFS and do so only down the road if a very clear need arose. Empathizing with, this part, at the, empathizing with him at this point was like staring into the abyss. Okay, for two reasons. Firstly, empathizing with him required me to set myself apart from the system of which I'm a part, uh, i.e. the medical system with its professional guidelines, its licensing regulators, and the authority of the modern scientific worldview and humanistic ethical framework. Setting myself apart from the system meant that I was foregoing the protection that it offered me, and I was thus exposed to the risk of being, being medical legally culpable should a bad outcome occur. Secondly, it was painful for me to empathize with him because it meant dying a bit of an ego death, personally. I had to contemplate what it meant that I personally exposed him to the terror of annihilation through my actions. I had to stare into the abyss only to find it staring back into me. David experienced my care as the threat of annihilation, just like what Richard almost did to him at age 13. But by empathizing with him, adopting his perspective and looking back at myself through his eyes, it was actually very valuable. Uh, firstly, on the systems level, I realized that the system uh, intruded upon our therapeutic relationship. The system threatened to smother the possibility of ongoing vigilant attunement and empathic resonance between two embodied human beings. My compulsion to call CFS, which so alarmed him, was a lack of responsivity to him in favor of the responsibility as defined by various regulatory bodies and sources of epistemological authority in medicine, a top-down unilateral blanket policy, if you will. I came to the conclusion, which I think is valuable, that I must not let this blanket policy intrude upon this particular situation. Secondly, I became forgivable, I think, through accepting and deeply recognizing that I triggered his past trauma, or perhaps I re-traumatized him in the present. Exemplifying and embodying humility and sorrow, he was able to see in me that I was someone who prioritized attunement to him on a human level over obedience to the system on one hand and over avoidance of my personal discomfort on the other. All of this accumulated in a connecting and unifying experience. And I mean this in a profound manner, which I will lay out in three final points. And I'll conclude with this. For David, firstly, uh, he realized that care or love need not be associated with control or annihilation. Perhaps care or love can be the participation in the generosity of reality, forgiveness, as John Bervicki tells us. Seeing me no longer thus as a part, he was able to see more deeply into me as a whole. And this internalization of my wholeness resulted in his own intrapsychic integration or healing. Now he's continuing to work on being a better father, and, I'm do and I think he's doing a good job of it. Uh, and I consider it a success that I'm able to continue to support him in doing so. For myself, secondly, I'm almost done here, uh, I experienced an enhancement of my own personal integrity, aided by his perspective upon me, and I was aided also, I think, by a courage that seemed to well up from a source from deep below me. And thirdly and finally, he and I both had the palpable experience that each of our individual integrations were only apparently separable, but they were not in fact separate from the other. This was the overcoming of separateness in terms of the self and other divide and the duality of subjectivity, objectivity. This was a transpersonal integration. We had a shared experience of the relational overcoming of psychiatric nihilism. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. On so many levels. 
Okay, questions, remarks, comments. Take I have a, a comment. Yeah. Um, I think like two weeks ago, I met with a community of people that I thought were getting together to talk about Heidegger, and I guess in some way they were, but it was around the the, the Dasein anal analysis and um, okay. tangentially the Zol Zolicon seminars, but um, they were all psychotherapists. <laughs> it was like all them and me. And um, <laughs> what you were sharing you today. Did you feel better all, What's that? You feel better afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> It was very interesting. I mean, a lot of what they were saying is it was kind of echoed in what you're saying, which is like really bringing these real life experiences with people and really understanding how being able to not have to get stuck inside of some framework, but be able to really dis listen deeply in that connection with the other person and how their 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 work with, you know, in this case, Heidegger had really allowed them to achieve that kind of releasement where they're not objectifying someone or they're not conflating them with what's happened to them in their past. And that like that, I found it, found it very interesting to see this kind of application towards psychotherapy. Um, Ian McGilchrist is a fantastic Scottish psychiatrist who has written about, um, well, left right hemisphere without getting into too much detail. He describes a lot of the um, knowledge systems that we have, and even the cultural institutions that we've created, you know, social constructs, as an externalization of um, an inbuilt capacity, like a neurologically instantiated capacity to uh, to essentially systematize, um, to to simplify the, the the reality of the world and kind of turn it into something usable. Um, so you're talking about we need to break out of these frameworks and stay connected to people. I completely agree. But the additional piece that I want to add here, aided by Ian McGilchrist, is that the very frameworks that we can get caught by are our own creations. Like they are externalizations of our um, a simplification, if you will, of, of reality into a usable model. And so um, this is what I think is very complex about our current technological state with AI, you know, and... Uh, that, I mean, there's so much to say here, but I think there's a, I want to kind of point out a complex interaction between a cultural level sort of emanation uh, um, of, of, of these frameworks. And then we ourselves are the ones who created the frameworks in the first place. So um, yeah, so thank you for, for pointing that out. That's awesome. Thanks for your talk. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Nathan. Lucas? Congratulations, um, Peter, for being so courageous. I mean, one thought that I want to ask you about: How did it feel to trans, uh, well, transcend or transgress, whichever word you, you you prefer, the frames that were professionally applied uh, to yourself? And another observation I have is that perhaps uh, this is the is an example uh, or an enactment of how can we um, save ourselves from a general system collapse through simple non-compliance with that system where things don't yeah. seem because they serve the system but don't really serve the, yeah. the being behind. So I'm just curious about your observation, but that's what struck me. It was an act of uh, in individual courage that transcended things, it seems to me here. Thank you, Lukash. Yeah, um, in my in a way, my story is uh, 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 an assertion of non-compliance. Okay, um, I'm going to stay connected to the human rather than let the system get between us um, with its blanket policies. So that you, um, I think you're right on with that. Now, courage, man. I don't want to take credit for it. I don't want to say that I'm a particularly courageous person. You know, in fact, I uh, many instances would prove to me that I may very well not be. But I'm talking about how um, this courage seemed to be like made available to me through a resonant process with another separate individual, seemingly separate, you know, but the sense of our in deep interconnectedness seemed to give me access to courage. Now, I needed courage because to answer your other question, Lukash, like I was terrified. I was kind of like hanging out nihilistically. You know, I, I had put distanced myself from the system. And then what if my patient committed suicide or harmed his daughter or all these terrible things that my risk averse colleagues were 
fixated upon. You know, I I probably looked pretty bad, and my my professional career was kind of flashing before my eyes. So I had a moment of uh, despair and terror. But on the edge of that, okay, okay. So the other thing I'll say here is this would be the argument why many people would say, just do CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, short-term evidence-based manualized treatments that you can mass produce and disseminate from an aloof, safe perspective of a, you know, um, of a scientifically oriented practitioner. But I'm, I would want to advocate for pressing through that threshold of terror and actually Maybe it's, we don't get burnt out when we do that. Maybe we don't make a terrible mistake when we make ourselves vulnerable to our patients. Maybe, in fact, we can help them and, in fact, discover deep meaning within ourselves. And that might actually be the paradigm shift that we need to ha- need that we need in the mental health system. Now, that's that's a bit you know uh, grandiose for me to say, but that's perhaps one idea that comes out of this uh, this presentation of mine. the self overcoming of nihilism, hey, like the transcendence of that terror by diving into it. But again, that was not my courage. That was something that David encouraged me to do. As I was saying, he he agreed to let me present this. And in fact, he and I are working together to write up the case because we're both mutually inspired by our experiences. And also the challenge this poses to the machine, to the bureaucratic machine. So oh, yeah. it escapes with that. Just nothing else to add. There's lots there, man. Thanks. Yes, Spencer. Thank you. Peter, that was really beautiful. Thank um, you. I thank you. I feel much richer for hearing your presentation. Um, I wonder, I'm going to be speaking a little bit on death in a much uh, more far out way. Um, and it seems like all over your talk, there are these instances of death. And yeah, I, the, the one that I'm sort of bringing, or I guess being attracted to, is this idea of the ego death that you had to incur. And I wonder, can you imagine a scenario where you would have been insulated from this ego death? What would have that, what would that have meant in the therapeutic context? And because you incurred the ego death, which I imagine had something to do with uh, a, a courageousness, uh, uh, what do you see that there were implications in your stance moving forward because of it? Well, a small version of this has happened in many of the cases that I've worked with. And I feel like what I'm doing is I'm refining or trying to hone in on what it is this what is this kind of therapy that I do certainly not what I learned in school in fact I felt so kind of depressed learning what I learned in school it felt so flat I didn't belong to it I couldn't belong in it it was a scientific uh, you know and, and humanistic ethical framework that kind of rejected me um so I've been kind of on my own path uh trying to sort this out and trying to you know really struggle with the questions like am I just jumping into burnout Am I just jumping into medical legal risk? Uh, am I just going to undergo an ego death and just get annihilated? But what I've uh, what I've paradoxically discovered is that it's actually by tunneling into this and going r- right in um, that there's a, a deeply meaningful uh, resource that's available. And I think this is if we insulate ourselves from that. Sure, we're protected. We can wrap ourselves in bubble wrap. But my, in my opinion, like if a surgeon said that, it would be the equivalent of them saying, I don't want to get any blood on my hands, you know, um, or like just in general in life. We could, Somebody mentioned COVID earlier. It's like if you live your life based on safety and avoiding any harm, you're just going to wrap yourself in bubble wrap and keep yourself at home. And that you've you've imposed a guaranteed risk upon yourself. So life is not about safety. I and mean, what I'm actually saying is that the, the medical legal system seems to like cent- like centrally uh, you know frame itself on safety and risk management and control? But I don't think that deep human connections are about that. That's wonderful. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I second all of that, Peter and Spencer. Thank you. Thanks again for this wonderful talk. Uh, do let me know when you've written all that up. Um, Sounds great. So, Thank you again. Uh, Spencer, Spencer Harris with glasses. 
Yeah. Yeah. I feel I, I feel fortunate uh, that I'm following Peter. I feel like Peter, you give uh, some flesh to what I'm going to try and uh, say. Um, yeah, I <laughs> my original movement was to try to invoke a symbol that I've been thinking about for a long time um, called Etna. And Etna is um, an allusion to the mountain that uh, the volcano that Empedocles leapt into to immortalize himself and be taken up by history. Um, and that didn't work and uh, deserved to be <laughs> combinatorially explosive. And I have something altogether different, although I think there is echoes of it. Um, so I will begin. When Zarathustra joins the gathering at the marketplace in what is called the Pied Cow to turn to the Overman, they cannot hear him. He warns them of the counter possibility of the last man, and they cannot hear him. So they say, give us this last man, O Zarathustra. The poet cannot be understood because they do not have ears to hear him, and to hear is to understand. The poet draws into what withdraws, a pointer, an uninterpreted sign. And yet they, who understand nothing but loud idle talk, cannot report any call. The poet's words unfold. They are not meant to immediately and accurately represent the state of things. The poet's word, the reflective word, is in the service of noesis, as he is of the ones who speak reflectively and verbally reflect. You might say he's the bad conscience of his neighbors, and they misappropriate his silent discourse as an occasion for passing it off as something which is not at all ascertainable or present at hand. If Zarathustra is as the conscience of his neighbors, his first pass at effecting a turning fails. The crowd is distracted and curious, and they would kill time if they could in the face of the long while of boredom. Boredom is one of the fundamental, mo <laughs> fundamental moods of the age. It glimpses homelessness. The glimpse is partial, but a kind of intimation, a hint or announcement. But so long as the everydayness reigns and the busyness of distraction is pervasive, they will blink from this to that and refuse the call to intimacy. The capacity for intimacy is bound up with the capacity to suffer. To suffer is to abide in. To catch hold of the hint and be led further and further on is to risk going off track. Of Socrates, Heidegger writes, all through his life and right into his death, Socrates did nothing else than draw into what withdraws, into the enigmatic and therefore mutable nearness of its appeal, even though the withdrawal may remain as veiled as ever. Socrates, famously identified with Eros, was in pursuit of what he lacks. He is famous for his wisdom, and yet he, he cannot give definitions for the virtues he is after. The dialogues tend to end in aporia, and yet the virtues tend to show up, only they evade capture. There is unconcealment and withdrawal. The double action harkens back to the simultaneity of docine and truth and untruth. The aletheic simultaneity is the condition for anagoge. Of the artistic experience, Rilke says, it lies so incredibly close to that of sex, to its pain and its ecstasy. The wanderer knows ecstasis insofar as he been, has been dispossessed of home. The artist is drawn into beauty. The beautiful is what sets the standard for what we trust we are essentially capable of. And this is what determines us to the extent we ascend beyond ourselves such ascent beyond ourselves to the full of our essential capability occurs according to Nietzsche in rapture. Heidegger also says of Nietzsche, life is life enhancement and ascendant life is rapture. The winking homelessness belongs to beauty where beauty is an invitation to intimacy, corresponding anagogic processing with reality. 
This is a beauty that begins as a burden. The recipient of the wink, be they thinker, poet, artist, wanderer, is at a loss. They realize the untenability of the orientation of the commons that forgets concealment in their resentiment. They are called to renunciate the logic of the present at hand, discourse as assertion, propositional certainty. And uh, to pull Johannes from your thesis, the metaphysics that shies away from the abyss leaves nowhere to stand. So going up is the movement of disillusionment that follows from the wanderers being attuned to homelessness. Their being without home, that does not mean here a mere lack of home, but rather the loss of the previous one in anticipation of and searching for the new one. In his solitude from out of his cave in high mountains, Zarathustra indwells and takes the perspective of the sun. He says, you great star, what would your happiness be had you not those for whom to shine? The hermit thus becomes empowered and overfull. He is called to go down like the sun and return redemptively to man. The saint breaks open the solitude of Zarathustra in the prologue and recognizes the wanderer from their previous meeting. At that time, he says, you carried your ashes to the mountains. Would you now carry your fire into the valleys? The saint reveals what we know. Zarathustra's deep sea solitude began with death. And what was Zarathustra's death? The forfeiture and rendering powerless of his own essence in the marketplace wherein modern humans are all the more homeless, not belonging, listening, being addressed or claimed because they flee into that which makes them forget the failed home and what should replace it. Now in spite of resentment and the unessencing of Justel, he would climb ashore because he loves man the saint's question echoes, would you now carry your fire into the valleys? And this question is not without intimation of possible danger and destruction. Before the second ascent, Zarathustra teaches the gift-giving virtue in the wake of being presented with the staff. Degeneration holds, he says, where the gift-giving virtue is lacking, where everything is for me. His teachings and the enactment of which is a reflection of the sun that gives itself Herein beauty swings round and is not what Zarathustra, what calls Zarathustra. It is rather loved and loved through. It is here a call to his fellows and a dangerous fire unleashed in the valley. What is this? To teach the Ubermensch, to say who it is and how it is, letting learn to be led into its essence. And to learn is to experience the danger. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Take your time and whenever you feel ready to ask a question or comment to speak up. Spencer, I have a question. Yeah. Is beauty to you, yourself, Spencer, to Spencer himself, mm -hmm. a, bur a burden? Is it a burden to you? I mean, I know what you, you were talking about. Mm. Um, and in yes. what way is it something that is expressed in your life, beauty? Mm. So first. That's such a good question. Thank you for asking that, Linda. Um, at times, <laughs> certainly beauty can be a burden. I think, hmm, I guess sometimes I would like to use um, something like an architectural metaphor. 
um, I imagine I imagine building um, a, a tower and uh, there are certainly times where standing on the tower I have built I am called uh, I'm, I'm called somewhere else and to answer that call I always have to descend and most generally to descend is to jump off this tower and I think a lot of the times to really answer up to the call of beauty is to in some way um, destroy something that's been created or reinterpret a history that's shared and so <laughs> I think this you know this this has to do with some sort of aspect shift on occasion and this aspect shift can it can be embarrassing you know John I hear John use a lot this like oh it makes all, it makes sense now I realized she was scared you know and when you've been acting out this understanding for two weeks, two months, two years, that the person in question wasn't scared, they were, um, you know, they were bad. Um, it can be, there's a, there can be a certain shame, um, a certain embarrassment to remember that history and take that failure to understand or that um, it, it's a uh, it can be humiliating um, immediately um, but I think uh, that humiliation can also um, if appropriated in the right way be uh, be a humility that is a uh, sort of like Luca said earlier, this, um, a, a fertile ground. Um, this definitely doesn't go into the autobiographical gut so much, but um, I hope that uh, satisfies your question, Linda. Yes. Um, so to you, beauty has an aspect of grief to it, in a way, because you're killing off what it is that you were before. And incorporate something into new into you that is new. I think. Certainly. Would you? Would, yeah, yeah. I uh, I think it does. I think uh, this is something like the pangs of birth. Um, it's uh, it's always very difficult, and sometimes this can mean your world gets smaller. Um, and sometimes this means that your world can get much bigger than you had thought it was. And these, uh, these, <laughs> these oscillations are very, uh, they can be dreadful and they definitely can cause grief. But I think to believe in the call of beauty and to have faith in its invitation is, uh, to have the courage to stand at the edge of wonder or the edge of the abyss and say yes that though I um, have in the past not been enough I can I can grow up I can be, become more responsible and I think this is the this is uh, important to the anagogic movement of the ascent. Yes, death in every moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Okay, if there are any more questions. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Lucas, yeah. Thanks, Spencer. It's super poetic. Um, thank you. Um, my question is I'm really curious how do you understand? the fire that Zarathustra 
is called to bring from the from the mountains, from the high hills into the valleys. What is it? How would you poetically or otherwise capture the essence of it? And if such things as essences exist. But yeah. <laughs> um I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you allowing me to uh, poetically uh, put it. Uh, I think this is where I can uh, best sort of explore. I think immediately when you asked this, I, I pictured the lightning strike. Um, and the lightning strike often um, is synonymous with an insight experience. Um, it's something very immediate. It's, it's violent and it's capable of um, breaking, but it's also capable of creating, kindling this fire. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, Zarathustra is this. I mean, I think this like uh, this uh, influence from Heraclitus, the fire as the logos, I think there's certainly some of this as well. Um, I think the fire as disclosing the way, I think there's something in this. I think the fire as destruction uh, is very important as well. And I think, I think in some way him bringing the fire down, and I was thinking about this earlier because this is sort of a movement, a Promethean movement, right? And it's, it's definitely that, right? It, but it's, it's, uh, it's an affordance rather than a technology. He's not bringing this way in which people can have the truth, right? He's bringing a possibility, and the possibility allows them to break open. And in that same chapter on the gift-giving virtue, he says, leave me, turn away from Zarathustra, destroy, forget me, destroy my teachings. Like, philosophy is autobiographical, follow yourself, you know? And I think there is this way in which if that, if we're going to listen to that call, the fire is the possibility of each listener igniting the hearth fire again so that they can have a center, so that they can have faith. Um, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. Okay, thank you very much, Eris and commentators. Lizelle, you're next. It's lovely seeing everyone again. Hello. Um, I don't really have a talk. I wrote, created a, a ritual together with the help of my beloved friend, uh, Rebecca Fox, who is a ritual artist. Well, she gave me a few tips. Everything good in it and everything embodied, it, embodied in it is her, everything else is me. Um, it's called uh, the first degree of staring into the abyss. It is only the first degree, but still it comes with a warning. Please do not uh, participate in this ritual if you are struggling with um, unresolved trauma or anything else, um, unless you can reach out to Peter or someone like that. And if you are in therapy, you can discuss it with your, your therapist and see if, if it's okay for you to do. Um, so I based it on um, the levels of Greg Henriquez, because John often says that that is the levels of reality he refers to. I did leave out the cultural level. Um, it didn't feel right, probably because the others map so easily on the Neoplatonic levels or the, the Suche, Fuse, Fuse, Suche, Nus, and then culture as the one just doesn't feel right. So I left out the cultural rim. There's only one, I'll just quickly run you through it. There's only one um, esoteric element in this. And that is for the people who joined the reading group. And I hope you get the joke. There's a banana in the ritual. So um, that we will start with a banana. You will need a candle and a banana and a pen. That's basically all you will need. Um, on the banana, you write your favorite L word. And with L, I mean those four L words, 
love, life, logos, or light. And then you put the banana to the side so that there's nothing except the candle in your side. Then you light the candle, and then I will still put a recording of me guiding you through the meditation on YouTube, but everything is already also written there, so you can just guide yourself through it as well if you want. Um, we go down through the levels and seeing everything dissolve. Like, imaginally having everything dissolve until we get to uh, at electrons the field nothing until we get to nothing and then we spend some time in the nothing um, I will ask you to hold your breath no I said it wrong I will ask you to stop breathing at that stage not for very long three times for 30 seconds if because I know a lot of people in this community actually do the Wim Hof method and all sorts of breathing techniques uh, if you are very good at holding your breath or not breathing, feel free to do that for a longer period. It's not about not breathing, it's just about having nothing, not even your breath present at that stage. Um, then we will spend some time there. I don't think, since it's just the first degree of uh, staring into the abyss, I don't think the abyss will stare back at you. I This is just getting to know the abyss a little bit, looking at it from like an angle, not quite face to face in the eye yet. Um, so don't worry about that. And then we will move up again through the levels. I don't use the words uh, emanation. I do use emergence a little, somewhat, but I do play on this idea of John of uh, through all the levels, there are <clears throat> emergence and, and emanation, both all, all the way up and all the way down, there's emergence and emanation. And um, I add, um, as we go up, the, the final level, I do add what I heard John sometimes call the canopy of being. So the, the other side of the ground of being. So Because we, we sink into the ground of being, and then we move up again to the canopy of being. And then I'm going to ask you to um, eat your banana, but mindfully of the word that you have written on it, to incorporate that L, love, logos, life, light, to incorporate it in your body and your knowing, knowing it by making it part of you. And that will, strictly speaking, be the end of the ritual. But um, I do recommend that you then spend some time reflecting on, oh, I forgot an important part. As you go up, um, when you reach, when something in you stirs, because when you when you come to the bottom of the abyss, I'm going to ask you to blow out the candle. Also for safety reasons, because we're going to hold our breath and uh, you don't want to um, fall face first into a flame if you hold your breath too long. And then as you come up, if something of, stirs in you on one of the le levels, uh, you light the, the candle again. And then afterwards, take some time to reflect on this level and then especially how it plays out horizontally in your life. So we have this vertical descent and ascent that we're doing and then reflecting horizontally how this plays. Um, that is actually the whole ritual. Thanks. Okay. Now. As always, we wait. Are you, are we waiting to get the banana and then we're going to do the practice? Or <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do it together. It's about a half hour ritual. Okay. If, so if how do we access it? I guess is my. I see the document, so I got that. So how do we? So if you keep the document, I will add uh, a link to the YouTube uh, on you at the new moon. Okay, it's a new cool. moon. And if when you add the link, because the, it's a it's a Google Doc, right? So it's it's a cloud document, so it'll automatically show up. Okay, that's cool. my understanding. Yes, that's awesome. Thanks, Lizelle. Can you put the links, please, on 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 the forum as well, so I can add them to the published version? I don't have the link. Yet. Okay, well, just no, the link that you shared here. Yeah, the link here, if you want. 
And in any event, you can just email me later on and I can just add it, you know, in some time in the future. So there's no, there's no deadline. I mean, it's, you know, so people can see it later on. Okay, Nathan, did you want to add anything else? No, no, that's awesome. I, I loved it. Yes, Spencer. Lizelle, I want to say, uh, <laughs> I want to say thank you for sharing, but I also want to say thank you for the esotericism. Um, I do appreciate the shout out uh, on behalf of the reading group. I think that <laughs> I, I feel brought in and I feel invited uh, in a very warm way. I just want to say I appreciate that. Thank you, Spencer. I I appreciated the the beautiful way you spoke just before I was uh, I had the opportunity to share this ritual. So thank you for that as well. Thank you for saying so. Any further comments or questions or? Uh, do feel free. I will. Um, I don't mind if you share the 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 document with people, but um, I'm gonna share my email address um, with just the group. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if, which... if, if you have, um, oh, sorry, if I forgot my surname. So if anyone has any uh, questions or comments or feel like I like this ritual, but I would like to have it a little bit amended, um, can you maybe advise me on how I can do that? Then please feel free to reach out to me. And can you give me a general understanding of uh, what you mean by uh, ritual and how, so how do you meet with other people to, um, and act such rituals and what do they signify so I'd, I'd like to just understand a bit better what um, you know when people so, ask what are your practices I always just say well you know I sit down and I write and then I read and then I write again and I read again so but then I know that this is entire what John refers to as an ecology of practices so I'd just like to hear a bit more about the whole scene if you like. I am I'm very fortunate to be in a group of women who with one of one of us is, like I've mentioned, Rebecca Fox, a ritual artist. And we do ritual on a regular basis together. We we celebrate the, the wheel. So on every big eight, eight big festivals of the year, we she designs a ritual for us to perform. Um, we we live all over the world, so we do it alone. We have all went to move, gone to Texas in February to do a three-day ritual together. So we are really invested in this this ritual practice. Um, uh, I often I, I refer to Rebecca as as my playwright, and I'm her actress. But I'm an actress with a lot of uh, improvisation uh, skill and room for that so what i often do is like the rituals that she would make for the big festivals i will amend it a bit and then do it on a more regular basis i have uh, morning rituals night rituals new moon rituals full moon rituals um sunday rituals uh, so there's ritual plays a, is a very big part of my ecology of practices and it's an attempt to make come alive the, let for example, philosophical texts, or the or concepts or words or. It's what I, what I like uh, really a lot about Re Rebecca's is it's so embodied, so it really brings brings the 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 the, the ideas to life indeed. Uh, I, I struggle with words sometimes, but it's easier for me to just 
perform it and to then feel it and to feel into it. I I also I I found ritual also actually a good way to to do theology as a type of faith seeking understanding. Be, because as I said when I was making this ritual initially it had culture in it but it didn't feel quite right. And for me that's also then a way of understanding at least what my understanding is of, of something. So then I will I will tweak the rituals a little bit until it feels right. And then I'm like, oh, this seems to be my my um, my view of things. And I also find it's it's um it's a way of being with uh, with ideas instead of just thinking it. Did you grow up with any ch genuine rituals? I mean, or so did you grow up religiously? Um, the ritual of going to church on Sunday, for example, or to the synagogue on Friday for the Shabbat? Yes, I, yeah. I'm a, I, I used to be a Catholic, uh, Calvinistic <laughs> preacher, actually. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I very much grew up and <laughs> went very dry. Very deep. Yeah, is, I, uh, <laughs> a Calvinistic preacher. What do you exactly do? stay at home, exactly. be pious, safe for the Calvinism earth. doesn't have that many rituals, but uh, I, yeah. I do remember that I, when I was a, a preacher, still I, I would try to incorporate like ritual within my my ser my my services. So I would because uh, I was uh, for a youth minister, and then I would ask him at a certain time to come up and light a candle or, or things like that. So I have always had this desire to incorporate ritual within my spiritual practices. Uh, okay, that's really fascinating. I, um, oh. Yeah, thank you. I, this is something I, I, I know um, very little about uh, or off, so I wanted to hear more, but yeah, go on, go on. Well, you, you will notice if you look at the heading, I made this especially for the Halkian Guild. That I thought it was a really nice title. Uh, the first degree of staring to was a ritual for the Halkian Guild uh, following the course beyond nihilism. Great. I think, uh, sorry, I see it now. Thank you very much. I hadn't opened it before, but now I have. Okay, fantastic. Um, Linda, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. So, Lizelle, um, the ritual itself, does that help you get into the right or express the right mindset so that the rhythm of the year unfolds for you in a way that's not necessarily spoken, but just sort of is embodied so that you're, you feel more of a part of the whole thing? Is that the way it works for you? That is beautifully said, Linda. Thank you very much. I wish that I could have said it that way. That is exactly what it is. Yes. It it also helps me be more aware and pay more attention to to the to nature, to to life, to to rhythms, to um, being here. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you. It's it's. Something that John was talking about, and so all of my teachers talk about, the, the importance of ritual to create mindset. It doesn't matter the particular type of ritual, depends on your culture, of course, but that you have it. It's it, it just getting that, that whole thing going. Because um, my teacher would do prostrations. And it would always bother me because that's very Asian. And I always thought, you know, that's that's being a doormat, you know. And mm -hmm. she, she was talking about it and going, you know, that isn't it. It has to do with when you're at the level she's at, she was at Abbas, to, to do a prostration means that you are a servant of and it brings your your whole mindset down and that is what she was using it for to keep it to keep that that idea of no i'm not really above everybody else i'm just you know right there along with them all i am is a guide and that kind of that, that's the value 
that she was talking about with the rituals. That's all. But whatever it is that it is for people, that's all. Oh, anyway, one little. It's beautiful. Bite. Thank you, Linda. So thank yes, you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Rebecca will often talk to people uh, and what what it what it is that they need in their life, and then she will make a ritual for them exactly to bring that in. So this is you is you the rep the. Example you gave is perfect for if you need um, to cultivate more humility or if you want to make sure you don't lose your humility. But there's, for instance, uh, I've started from the, the wisdom of Apithia. There's, um, they talk about um, uh, saying the words, um, I see my goddess as Sophia. Um, so then saying the words, if you have a god, then he, if you have a goddess, then she. Um, she, I am she whom, whom I love, and she whom I love is me. And then repeating it to yourself over and over again, if you want to cultivate that that uh, intimate knowing of 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 the divine. Um, and I com combine it then with with uh, uh, that Catholic uh, Catholic beads, a rosary, and doing because I have. Cal uh, Catholic friends and they have rosaries and now I have one. So it's it's fun. We play around with diff we're from different traditions and then we play around with the different uh, rituals and mesh them all together. Great, thank you. All right, Harris. Yes. Hello everyone, I, I have been enjoying uh, this course a lot and also all the talks in the pro seminar. And without uh, any further ado, I would like to present uh, my own uh, uh, presentation that I've prepared. Um, the title is uh, The Lost Art and Science of Declamation and a Tripartite Extension to the Vervagian for Peace of Knowing. So um, actually, in a way, it links a bit with uh, uh, Spencer's uh, talk. So uh, here it goes. Wasn't it Nietzsche's Zarathustra who thus spoke that there is more wisdom in your body than in your deepest philosophy? Indeed, it was. And you may wonder, what shall we make out of such a profound exhortation? From the shift in vocal timbre to the not so subtle gestural orchestration that complements one's speech by adding layers upon layers and textures and colors to it. Shouldn't we reach back in time then and salvage that long forgotten and lost art and science of declamation? I think that we most certainly do just that. And we should do it specifically in the context of moving beyond nihilism, solitude, and even the meaning crisis altogether, as there seems to be a pressing need and a sense of utmost urgency for reclaiming what, has, what had been lost. You see, declamation was propounded in ancient Greece and Rome as an, as an, an ancient yet highly relevant mode of rhetoric and a core part of narrative pedagogy. However, declamation has declined and disappeared in the modern era, as it has been replaced by other forms of communication, such as writing, printing, broadcasting, and digital media. Declamation is now considered a lost art and science, as it is no longer practiced or appreciated by most people. Declamation is now seen as a relic of the past, yet here I am in my honest effort to bring it back. Declamation is the art of speaking publicly in a way that is effective, eloquent, and persuasive. It strives to convey knowledge through articulation, utterance, intonation, emphasis, and gesture. It involves the use of various recorded rhetorical devices, such as repetition, parallelism, antithesis, metaphor, and irony, to enhance the impact and appeal of the main points of one's message. It requires a clear structure, a strong voice, and a confident delivery, and with the appropriate variation in tone 
the speaker can express and communicate great amounts of information to their audience. The change of tone can bring out the beauty of the speech by adding variety, emotion, and clarity to the delivery. A speaker who uses different tones can capture the attention of the audience, convey their feeling and intentions, and emphasize the key takeaway message. Tone or tonos in Greek always sends a message to the listener. And the role of tonal spice in declamation is to add a sense of spontaneity and interest to the speaker's voice and to convey different emotions and moods directly to the audience. On the other hand, gestures can also play an important part of declamation as they can make the speech more lively, engaging, and even persuasive. Gestures that are varied, expressive, and graceful can attract and maintain the attention of the audience, can clarify or illustrate an argument or a point, and can also involve the audience in the speech by building rapport with them. Therefore, for all these reasons, declamation sharpens our communication capacities greatly. Now, it should be clear, clearly stated that by engaging in declamation, one can activate different types of knowing, depending on the purpose and context of the speech. I would like, therefore, to offer to you all some examples and ways of how declamation can relate to Professor John Vervaki's four piece of knowing and how it additionally relates to a tripartite extension to them that I am currently proposing. The four piece of knowing are participatory knowing, that is knowing how to act in the agent and arena environment, which is the dynamic and interactive relationship between the agent, the self, and the arena, the world. And declamation, I believe it can enhance participatory knowing by developing one's skills and abilities to communicate effectively, adapt to different situations, and engage others through speech. Secondly, per pers perspectival knowing, this is knowing what it's like to be in a particular situation or state of mind, which is the subjective and experiential aspect of cognition. Declamation can enhance perspectival knowing by cultivate, cultivating one's empathy, imagination, and emotions through speech. For example, declamation can involve imitating or impersonating different characters, emotions, or viewpoints in order to persuade or entertain the audience. Thirdly, procedural knowing, this is knowing how to do something, which is the practical and instrumental aspect of cognition. Declamation can enhance, I think, per se, procedural knowing by teaching one the rules and methods of speech co composition, delivery, and evaluation. For example, declamation can involve learning and applying various rhetorical devices figures of speech, gestures, tones, and styles in order to create and perform effective and memorable speeches. Finally, propositional knowing. This is knowing that something is true, which is the factual and descriptive, descriptive aspect of cognition. Declamation can enhance propositional knowing by providing one with information and knowledge about various topics, issues, or arguments that are relevant to the speech. For example, declamation can involve researching and presenting facts, evidence, or opinions in order to support or refute a claim or, posi or position. Now, uh, the three piece extension to the Vervagian four piece of knowing that I am proposing are the following. The first one is called perspicacious knowing. This is knowing with deep insight, sagacity, and practical wisdom, which is the ability to notice, understand, or judge things accurately and quickly, especially those things that are not obvious or clear. Declamation can enhance perspicacious knowing by challenging one's critical thinking, intuition, and reasoning through rhetoric. For example, declamation can involve analyzing and evaluating different sources, various arguments or multiple perspectives in order to find the truth or the best or near optimal solution to a particular complex problem, task, or puzzle. Secondly, 
perfusive knowing. This is knowing with an overflowing, swarming type of collective and not necessarily, necessarily individual knowing, which is the phenomenon of collective intelligence or wisdom of the crowds, where a group of people can perform better than an individual on certain tasks. Declamation can enhance perfusive knowing by fostering one's collaboration, cooperation, and feedback through speech. For example, declamation can involve working with others to, pre to prepare and deliver speeches or listening to other speeches and providing constructive criticism or even praise. This is how startup comedians test their jokes, actually. They let the audience decide what is best for them to keep in their routine. Lastly, um, we have, I propose palindromic knowing. This is something different and it is knowing with an almost historical literacy or even numeracy type of knowing, such as the knowing that arises out of the reversibility found in historical inscriptions, such as nipsona nomimata mimon mimon anopsi, a Greek palindrome that translates into wash my transgressions, not only my face, that was inscribed upon a holy water font near the entrance of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. It can also be found in short phrases such as madam, I am madam, or in single words such as civic, or even <clears throat> in more modern words such as radar, and even in numbers such as 1,771 or 1771. Declamation can enhance palindromic knowing by exposing one to the symmetry and beauty of logic and language through careful observation, utterance, and articulation. Harris? Concluding? Yes. Okay, concluding? Concluding my speech, I would like to add that in the current age of information, with the rise of contact-free languages, text-to-speech technologies, and more recently, large language models, at bare minimum, that last type of palindromic knowing, knowing is not necessarily shared solely by humans, but also by the mach machines. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Harris. As always, very detailed, ready for publication. Okay. Any questions, comments, remarks? Take your time and then just speak up. Harris, um, are you going to be speaking with John a little bit about this? Maybe a discussion would be really good, I think, because um, it would be very interesting to, to listen to the interaction between how uh, John thinks about the four P's and things and you and discussions back and forth, because I think that would be very useful, especially um, participatory knowing. Um, I think that's what we've lost a lot in online work and things like that. So anyway, are you... Please, if you get a chance to talk to him, please do so. And I would love to watch a discussion between the two of you. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. That will be a great honor. And thank you for your kind words. We will see if it can be arranged. I have his email address somewhere. <laughs> He's even slower than me, though, when it comes to responding to email. OK. Any more questions, comments on Harris's contribution? Take your time.
If there are none for now, then Nathan, you're the last speaker, actually. Because um, I think Sean has disappeared again. So you are. <laughs> yeah, he's been. I think Come, he's having yeah, a, I think it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. German internet. What can you do? So. All right. H how much time do we have? <clears throat> uh, I'll give you a minute and a half, perhaps, Nathan. Okay. Would that be enough for you? <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Eight, eight minutes. I'll let you know when it's, um, you've got three minutes left and two minutes left. I'll, I'll message you on the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to give a talk on uh, Heidegger's method of, dis of destructive reading. And just as a context, I this, this piece is in a... It's connected to another piece that I did for one of Johannes's courses where trying to distinguish the difference between the kind of coaching that's happening today, which is very focused on a kind of a technological attunement and focusing on optimization versus a kind of coaching that is much more um, geared towards flourishing. And I'm trying to bring in this love and the Gelassenheit and the allowing um, into a kind of listening. So that's the kind of context in which this talk will take place. So uh, Martin Heidegger's diagnosis of the Western philosophical tradition, particularly from Plato onward, is that it led to a kind of forgetfulness of being, right? According to Heidegger, philosophy became overly preoccupied with particular beings and with metaphysical systems that purported to explain those beings. And the shift away from the question of being led itself to a variety of modern problems, one of which is nihilism. Nihilism for Heidegger is not the belief that life lacks meaning or lacks value. It's a consequence of the, aban of the abandonment of the question of being, right? A losing sight of the ground or source from which the concepts of the Western philosophical trad tradition and all of its kind of horizons of intelligibility, its meaning, its values, originally emerged. So my, my argument is that Heidegger's answer to nihilism is not to try to overcome or to go beyond it, nor is it possible to create new meanings and values from nothing, ex nihilo, right? I argue that for Heidegger, what is called for is to go into the source of where the original concepts emerged that put Western philosophy on a particular trajectory that culminated with Nietzsche, right? He called, he called himself the consummate nihilist. And to discover possibilities that were latent in the originary experience of the thinkers where the creation of the concepts that initiated this mission or this course of Western metaphysics as a, as a substance ontology but were never articulated or brought to light and as such have in some sense laid dormant as a possibility that could be brought to the light for the destructive reader who can access them in a way that the original thinkers didn't have access to in the moment because the the nature of being itself is that as it reveals itself to us there's also a concealing of not even other hor uh, horizons of possibilities, but the concealing of something that we don't know. And that's where the, the method of phenomenological destruction it comes in, right? So despite Heidegger's own statement in section six of the introduction of being in time, that the method of, dis of destruction was positive, two of Heidegger's Students claim that Heidegger was Werner Marx and Hans Gord, Hans Georg Gadamer claim that Heidegger was was doing with his destructive method uh, of reading was fundamentally negative. They saw that the intention of the destructive met method was an attempt to deconstruct traditional thinkers in order to debunk and leave it leave them behind. Right? The argument was that destruction was simply a preliminary step. 
and that they argued that what Heidegger sought to do was destroy a thinker's argument so that one could leave them behind in order to think newly out of the space that was left behind in, in this kind of negation or a dismantling or deconstruction of that thinker's position. In other words, the intention was to get inside of the thinker's own thought, understand them better than they understood themselves, blow up their argument from the inside, and then pass beyond them. And in, in, in Warner Marx's book, Heidegger and the Tradition, he sees that what Heidegger is doing is, as, is an opposition to, uh, to the tradition, right? The Heidegger and the tradition he sees as, as a disjunctive. And he sees Heidegger on one side and the tradition on the other, setting them off completely um, from each other. And he argues that Heidegger wants to take philosophy in a completely other direction and in a completely different dimension than philosophy has traditionally operated in. And I would argue that this interpretation of Heidegger's method of destructive reading is not only wrong, but that the impact of the misreading cuts one off from understanding and enacting what Heidegger would later call inceptual thinking or um, productively engaging with the tradition, who, especially for the Greeks, were, for Heidegger, the only possibility of being speaking to Dasein again and allowing a new beginning to emerge. So inceptual thinking, as I understand it, is a kind of way of relating to truth as aletheia, kind of non-propositionally, that would allow a new realm or horizons of meaning and intelligibility to emerge. So there's a few a few problems with his argument, right? First of all, is that the interpretation would have to disregard completely what Heidegger says himself about the destructive method and being in time, where he says that to bury the past in nullity is not the aim of destruction. He says that destruction is, well, I'll just read this quote. So he says that the question of being is to have its own history made transparent. If the question of being is to have its own history made transparent, then the hardening of tradition must be loosened up and the concealments which it has brought about must be dissolved. We understand this task as one in which, by taking the question of being as our clue, we are to destroy the traditional context of ancient ontology until we arrive at those primordial experiences in which you achieve our first or our first ways of determining the nature of being than ways in which we have been guided ever since so there's a longer quote but i'll move on for time right so the question really is how can heidegger justify this claim and so my argument is that and by the way this argument is highly influenced by there's a guy Sean Kirkland's new book called The Deconstruction of Aristotle really amazing book for understanding is the deconstructive method uh the destructive method <clears throat> my argument is that what Heidegger wants to do is to dig back into the text of the tradition and unearth wisdom there but that's there but not brought to light so he's got kind of two steps one is the destruction of concepts that in the formation kind of established the trajectory of all of, tr of traditional philosophical thought and then go back into that original experience where the concepts first emerged and attune oneself attentively or listen for new possibilities that can be heard uh, and, and as such being can speak to us in ways that were available at the time but not articulated or they weren't taken up. For example, Heidegger reads the moment where um, Aristotle is, est is establishing the traditional concepts and listens for what Eric Aristotle is indicating in the experience he was having preconceptually that wasn't thematically articulated or brought to light, right? And this is the ground out of which Heidegger wants to go in and develop new concepts or ways of thinking about, for example, just as an example, his idea of truth, his idea of essence. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, how much more do you have? Uh, well, so I'll just, I'll just summarize. Okay. So the claim is that Aristotle had this experience of the ground, right? That Aristotle was responding to a call. 
and that Aristotle did respond to the call. But what was missing was the recognition that what he was doing was responding to a call, something something along those lines. And that that's where the destructive method of reading is to go back into that experience and name the thing that the original speaker was unable to name because it literally withdrew for them in that moment as they were developing a concept. That's kind of how I understand uh, the concept creation process. And that's why Heidegger was always interested in these ground, what he calls Grundbegriffs, right? These, these ground concepts where there's still that kind of fertile ground for thinking. So in Heidegger's later in Heidegger's later work in, in what is called thinking, there's he calls thinking as thanking. And there was this idea of memory and there's a profound respect for the, for the tradition that I think is there. And it's humble and it's open and it's receptive. And I think that's Heidegger's real answer for how to deal with Gestell and the and and the the totalizing of technology, which is to come back into relationship with being in a way where there's a relationship to truth that has nothing to do with man's purposes in that sense, right? There's almost like the pole of agency moves over to being and we're relating to being as something that can speak to us again, instead of as an instrument instrument for our own design. So I'll just end with this is I'm very I'm very interested in this because in coaching, when we treat people or even the even when people seek coaching, they're often looking for solutions to their problems or ways to optimize or they're treating themselves without knowing it as a technological being. And that this whole attempt to even solve a problem, it it re it establishes the fact that there is a problem. And what is needed is this ability to go back, let's say, to a moment where someone made a made a made a decision, a concept about themselves, about the world, about others, that wasn't an error. It wasn't a problem. It wasn't a mistake that they made. It was a concept that was generated in that moment that led to a kind of a trajectory for the future. And if they can go back and not to the past, but if they can go back and go into that ground, there are other horizons of possibility and meaning that are available for someone to generate newly uh, a concept of themselves, world, and others. And that's where I think Galassenheit and as a response to the technological attunement is something that can make a difference as coaches and teachers and therapists, as like Peter was saying earlier. Excellent. And Peter has already raised his hand. <laughs> that was very quick. So just briefly, you mentioned coaching. Are you talking about philosophical coaching? Uh, so I do like ontological phenomenological coaching that we, there's a, there's our company. That's what we do. Oh, amazing. Uh, I, I'd be interested to hear more about that. But um, but I guess that there's another comment I just want to maybe add in, <clears throat> which is that what you got me thinking about at the very end there is related to a TED Talk I saw. You were talking about how people coming to sort of therapy or counseling with a problem might actually be reifying the problem. Um, and there's a certain instrumentalization that takes place of the person uh, when they don't simply show up in like a Dazane in L analytic institute and just let's be together towards death. <laughs> yeah. Or let's enter the being mode or something, right? They, they, they crystallize the problem that they're actually trying to solve, um, that they're trying to solve and thus might kind of undermine themselves. Uh, so anyways, that got me thinking about something I heard about in, um, in TED Talk. The idea is, a, is similar, but very differently put. The idea of different uh, difficult decisions. So somebody might face a difficult decision in their life. And the definition of a difficult decision, according to this uh, presenter, was that it's a decision that has no right or right or wrong answer necessarily, mm -hmm. but that the decision that you make define uh, interacts with your identity formation and you, you become who you are based on which direction you go and commit to. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to offer that because I think that it feels like a different angle on, on what you were bringing up here. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, so in the tr in the training in our in our approach, it is the identity that gets created in those moments, 
right? So, er, you know, there were, we were talking about the ground in which a concept is made, which then kind of had an impact on the history, the, the the future of philosophy, and that that wasn't a mistake or an error. It's just a natural consequence of making a concept. There are all these other things that were available that weren't seized upon. And there is a kind of identity that gets established there. So I'm trying to make that make that bridge to people. And that's how I understand the these moments where these decisions are made. There is it it, it creates an identity. And it's not right or wrong. It's just what is, right? And so even something that's a traumatic experience, if we relate to it like it's something we need to get rid of, it cuts us off from the actual healing that needs to take place, right? And that it's not right or wrong, it's just what is. And if we can get into right a relationship with it, something else can emerge, which I think is what you were saying as uh, well. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Nathan. Yeah. And I think based on, in addition to what you're saying, the thing I didn't really get to talk about is time. So the nature of temporality and the kind of temporality that Dasein has if there was a substance ontology that actually reified time and that became the kind of the the framework through which things were thought about what actually gets cut off and is our relationship to what it the the finitude that that is that we are as human beings and so the analytic tradition to get rid of history and the transhumanist impulse to get rid of death and to get rid of finitude actually are kind of natural consequences of not having a profound relationship to the kind of ecstatic temporality that we have. Ecstatic, that is not aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, ecstatic. Um, okay, any more questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I feel like it's very hard for me to like frame this question um, it, while being respectful to the content. And maybe the best way to say it is, um, it, with this in mind, what do you think the wrong way to read into the tradition is? Well, me, me personally, or <laughs> I mean, if. Hmm. It, yeah, if we want to try to maybe be in this, uh, if we want to say something like Dasein with or just abiding together, um, is this something we would want to do in our reflection on the tradition as you and I, Nathan, uh, participate in it? Mm. Okay, so I think I think one of the... One of them, I don't know. I want to. I don't want to call it a mistake, right? Because I'm not like, not the author of like the, you know, what's right and wrong. But I think one one challenge has been to go in and think that what Heidegger was saying or saying that what we should do is somehow go in and try to understand the thinker better than they understood themselves, or try to recreate their initial uh, or or what their intention was or something like that. I mean. Getting inside of the thinker is something that definitely Heidegger would say is an important, right? He did 17 lecture courses on Aristotle. So he spent a very long time understanding this person from the inside out. And by the way, Heidegger doesn't say that he's achieved the new beginning or the kind of thinking that's going to create anything, right? So I think what 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 we don't want to do is go in and try to try to figure out what was the what was the intended meaning or or the something like that, right? He's not interested in kind of textical exegesis and things like that. Can I? I don't know if that answers your question, but. I will say a few words now. There's um, um, Heidegger's uh, grandson told me a story this year, which is, which goes as follows. He had a, a PhD student, a uh, young lady. This is the early 1930s, I think. He may just have come to Freiburg or maybe she was in Kiel or somewhere else. But in any event, she completely tore apart his Aristotle interpretation that was available at the time. And he had one comment on her work, which was, sie hat einfach recht. She's just right. So um, he does not think 
that he's the pinnacle or the one and only who gets everything right and Plage was wrong and Aristotle was wrong, etc. That's whoever claims that has not read Heidegger and is on a personal crusade himself. Um, there's something else that, that Nathan uh, pointed out that's very crucial, uh, which or at least that led me to this. As I said before, Plato is not a Platonist, Aristotle is not an Aristotelian. When we read the work, the Metataphysica, we get the word metaphysics from a, li a librarian in Alexandria who placed a collection of books by Aristotle after a work entitled Taphysica, the things concerning physis, metataphysica. So Aristotle did not write a metaphysics. Plato certainly did not write a metaphysics. The word didn't even exist. And what's striking when you read the metaphysics, what Aristotle is struggling with is how to describe a singular thing. And in thinking, in actual philosophical thought, once you reach pure thought, certain quote unquote things or certain moments actually become necessary. So by the way, the ideas, the forms, whatever we try, however we translate a, a die in Plato are not things, they're not objects, they're not entities. They're logical moments, and they are necessary logical moments. And that is also what happens when Aristotle in Book 7 introduces the notion of to hypokemenon, that which underlies. Thought needs to ground itself. Now, in the tradition, this word becomes substance. And all of a sudden, also the word usia, which means presence, or homestead, also is translated as substance. No difference made. I have a copy here from the Loeb Classics, the standard Harvard University Press uh, edition of Aristotle, where they translate totienenai, which means that which was being, that which was being is translated as formal cause. Now that destroys absolutely everything. Destroys, but not in the Heideggerian sense of destruction. <laughs> yeah. That is, that there's nothing left. But what we have now is a schema. Oh, Aristotle just talks about matter and form and all the four causes, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't speak of causes at all. That's a Latin term. So what Heidegger does, which is what any great thinker would do, who actually tries to read the thinkers that he reads, is to just go back to the text and read the text again without using the preconceived notions of the tradition. But you have to make a distinction again between tradition and traditionalism, perhaps. So tr traditionalism would be a, 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 a blind sort of, yeah. Plato presents the two world uh, 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 paradigm, and there are the forms up here and the ephemeral things down here. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> Read Plato, and you'll find that that's not the case. But then there's another layer to this, which ties us back to what Linda pointed out in the beginning, which is the issue of translation. How do we translate those old texts or even just texts today? You know, I speak a couple of languages and I can tell you, I cannot say the same thing in English that I can say in German and the other way around. Uh, so sometimes when I translate a word into, so I gave an example here, verwinden. Heidegger used to not speak of overcoming, as Nathan pointed out, but of verwinden, which is an invention by Stefan Georg, a German poet. So verwinden could perhaps mean something to the effect of to over to go in and then to overturn from within. So it becomes a bit longer. So you cannot really actually find a corresponding term in the dictionary. So the translation becomes a literal um, reading again. Uh, or, or delivering something over into another vernacular so that it begins to speak in a different way. So, for example, being in time, or Heidegger later, Heidegger speaks of Möglichkeit. Möglichkeit, he connects to mögen, which means to like, to love, to appreciate. Possibility speaks of power. Posse is power. Potere, potentiality. When Heidegger says in the letter on humanism that being is the sein, is das Mögliche, he stresses that it, it, it's that which likes and loves us. And here's something that's completely anti-modern. When, when we read Plato or read Aristotle, read the first pages of the Nicomachean Ethics, 
Aristotle is addressed and called forth by the good. That is not how we think of it. We To be called forth and in the need to respond um, to that call. That is what the Greeks um, all really share, that they're called forth by something other. Okay, that's my two cents <laughs> on this. Thank you all very much. Are there any more comments or questions on, on Nathan's uh, talk? Yeah, or anything, or anything that was said today, Lissell, yeah. I, I actually have a question for you, Johannes. I was planning to ask this later, but you've just talked about it. Um, I, I can read Koine because I studied theology, of course, but I'm trying to read um, learn classic Greek now. But it's really difficult to find a really good dictionary. Do yeah. you have a... Uh... Uh, so I only, I use, um, I have a German one. I don't know, do you know any German? Uh, no. A little it's, bit. It, as far as I know, there's a new one out by Cambridge University Press that was published only a few years ago. Um, and by you, maybe, and that's, so that's a physical copy that, that will be a good start. And it, it will always be a good idea, though, to, uh, to look at the, look at the suggested translations and then uh, <clears throat> still, however, consider the, the context uh, in which something is said. And then also realize that, you know, Aristotle and Plato, perhaps, just to speak of these two, uh, Logos does not always mean the same um, uh, everywhere in every passage. Um, and to use perhaps the, the Perseus uh, can be quite helpful. This is, um, I think, I don't even, is it, is it the MIT or is it, no, it's, what is, what is Tufts again? It's not like MIT. Uh, the Perseus Digital Library, Tufts University. So this one might be good. Uh, you've got. Uh, yeah, Harris just put that same link in there. Ah, okay, excellent. Yeah, that's He's reading your mind. <laughs> yeah, uh, that can be really helpful, and and yeah, and as you are, uh, you know, trans translation can be a sort of a ritual. Uh, in a way that um so it's not a ritual when you sit down and you you know you type a text into google translate and it spits out within a nanosecond a perfectly corresponding uh translation that's language reduced collapsed into communication that can lead to very funny things when you try putting in idiomatic language right thank you all very much um i enjoyed that a lot listening to your contributions over the past two months or three months or however long that's been and also tonight uh i hope that um whatever you were looking for you're closer now <laughs>